We are good to go, uh, Chair. Okay, thank you. If I could ask Council to uh, turn their cameras on then and we'll, when it, once everyone's here, we can get started. <clears throat> And Councillor Parks is still trying to resolve some technical issues, is she? She's just coming in here now. Okay. Okay. Okay, it's six o'clock and everyone's here, so we'll call the meeting to order at six o'clock. Um, I'll just uh, read a little preamble first. Uh, welcome to the Committee of the Whole Session being held virtually this Monday, March 1st, 2021. I'll be chairing the meeting as Mayor Brzee uh, has sent his regrets and is unable to attend tonight's meeting. No closed session was scheduled or held tonight. Notice is being provided that this electronic meeting is being live streamed and recorded and will be available on the township website. If there is a problem with the technology impacting the proceedings of the meeting, the meeting may be recessed at the direction of the chair to confirm that electronic format is performing effectively before proceeding further with the agenda. In the event of connection or service disruption, the chair may recess the meeting to allow for attempts to reconnect. If I am disconnected or experience internet issues, I'll ask that uh, Councillor Porter assume the chair while I'm unable to. And uh, just for the record, I'll just note that Councillor Gordon has sent his regrets for tonight as well. So with that, we will move ahead. So uh, the next item is the adoption of the agenda. Um, any additions or changes from staff that we're aware of? Seeing none, um, could I get a motion to adopt the agenda? Councillor Townsend, seconded by Councillor Parks. All in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof. Councillor Porter? Yes, I'm going to declare a um, disclosure of pecuniary interest on 4.2 policy review development security requirements as I have a financial interest in a company that currently has posted securities with the municipality. 4.2, okay. Thank you. Any other disclosures this evening? Seeing none. We uh, will move right into the staff reports then. So 4.1, repair of boulevards, construction or routine maintenance. And the Director of Economic Growth and Community Development, um, MJ, do you have, uh, want to speak to this? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, we have actually uh, Ms. Campbell, the Manager of Engineering and Environment, uh, will do that presentation. Okay, thank you. Ms. Campbell, whenever you're ready. Hi, thank you. Um, okay, I just need to share my screen here. I have a short presentation. Okay. Are you able to? I can see that, yes. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, thank you. I'm here tonight to discuss uh, the policy review for the repair to Boulevard's uh, construction of construction and routine maintenance. Um, so the repair to Boulevard's uh, construction or routine maintenance policy currently states um, that we're to use sodding for all future urban repairs. As the um, as the report outlines. Um, in, to, in 2020, we did a review of the sod pricing and the seed pricing. Um, the sod pricing, sod on top soil per square meter was 
$21 and change and the uh, seed price per square meter was $14 and change, um, representing a 50% uh, higher cost per square meter for sod and topsoil as compared to seed and topsoil. So we did some calculations on some of our older projects and some of our proposed projects for this year and determined that um, if council was amenable to, um, to repealing that existing policy, um, it could result in savings of thousands of dollars for a typical ur urban renewal project if seed was used uh, in some or all areas as compared to sod. Um, staff feels that the policy creates an unnecessary burden of care on residents and contractors um, and that we've had just as much success in our semi-urban and rural projects using topsoil and seed as, as compared to topsoil and sod. Um, so part of the issues that we've had is that we have had issues with sod dying in, on, in our urban projects, um, sometimes as a result of issues with ongoing maintenance after the contractor's 30-day warranty period. Um, so the, the contractor is responsible under our special provisions for watering and maintaining the sod for 30 days after it's laid. Um, and then after that, our residents are responsible for maintaining the sod uh, on their lawns. Um, so sometimes we have issues where we have residents who are not able to care for that um, and provide the watering and those sorts of things that we require of them, which causes issues. Um, also, the concern is that we're asking residents to, um, you know, use their own water to water the lawns after an urban project is completed on their street. Um, this often results in warranty claims made by the township where the contractors are responsible to come back to um, replace sod that has died um, during the one year warranty period for the contract, or sorry, two year warranty period for the contract that follows substantial performance. Um, this is a picture of this year where grass seed uh, was successfully used on Edgewood Road um, during a reconstruction project there. So you can see um, the grass is, is growing well, despite the fact that we've used seed. Um, I would just mention that in this picture, the shoulder work has not been uh, completed fully as of yet. So it does uh, not look as lovely on the shoulder as uh, it did once the project was complete. Um, this is a project on Morden Crescent in Amherstview where sod was used. So um, I, I will admit that this picture is, you know, one of the worst that we've had, but we do have issues with sod dying. We have issues with weeds. Um, and in these sorts of situations, um, the concern is that it's a lot harder to overseed and fertilize um, when sod has been laid as compared to when seed has been put down. Um, so those are some of the issues that we run into. So the recommendation from staff is that the policy be repealed. Um, I want to stress that that doesn't mean that we will never specify the use of um, sod in our urban renewal projects. Uh, it just means that it would give staff a choice of the different um, options to use in various situations. So, um, you know, that may result in a mix of solutions on certain projects where in some areas of the project seed is specified and in other areas of the project, such as on steep uh, ditch slopes or in high traffic areas, such as around parks, um, we may still specify the use of sod. Um, as I said before, it allows for problem areas to be corrected more easily. And I also just wanted to note that staff will continue to undertake quality control and quality assurance activities um, regardless of the type of uh, uh, reinstatement measures that are used. So that includes um, the requirements of OPS in terms of measurable requirements and sampling activities, um, as well as our own special provisions that we have uh, written by township staff and that um, the seed mix would be specified and checked for any hydro seed operations that are permitted um, to ensure that we're getting uh, the appropriate um, seed mix that, uh, you know, isn't full of weeds and all of those sorts of things that uh, are sometimes a concern. That is uh, my presentation for this 
uh, report and I am happy to answer any questions or um, provide any further information council wishes to have. Thank you. Um, could I just ask that we stop sharing the screen? I can't see all of council. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. There we go. Thank you. Um, okay, so council, do we have any questions or for uh, staff regarding this report? And Council Budrick? A few concerns as I, uh, I live on one of the streets that was uh, refurbished years ago with this. Um, <clears throat> I'm not one to complain about um, weeds or grass because as long as it's green, I'm fine. Um, I do know that there were some of my neighbors uh, on my streets uh, and my street and the neighboring street, as well as a former mayor who is very proud of his lawn that uh, did take some issue to it. And uh, as long as, as long, and, and I want to save the money, trust me, if we can find a spot to save money, that's an awesome thing to do. I just, as long as we make sure that the, the quality uh, is researched ahead of time and the, uh, uh, the service is put behind it. Uh, it's great, but uh, just make sure we do our due, due, due diligence going forward. But that's all I really have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from council? Seeing, seeing none. Um, just following up on Councillor Budrick's comment there, I think you touched on it in your presentation and in the report, but um, if, uh, if you're in an area where residents request the sod um, versus seed, that would be an option, like that would be an option for discussion with the residents then. Um, it's just that, again, they would be responsible for watering after the warranty period is done. Is that correct? Um, yeah, so uh, yes, they would still be responsible for watering after the warranty period is up. Um, and the first part of your question, so when we do these sorts of projects, we have a public information center where we provide the public with the proposed drawings so they're able to, to sort of, you know, see what's being proposed. And certainly at that time, we could have discussions with residents um, to you know, discuss concerns and if there are specific locations where, you know, we were proposing to put seed and they were hoping to see sod, we could certainly have those discussions um, to determine what the what the best step forward would be. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Parks. Sorry, I just wanted to follow up on, on a, a comment from Ms. Campbell. It would be nice if residents would have some way of knowing that that is an option. Um, I know myself um, in my home, we live along Church Street in the village of Bath and when the reconstruction was done on the road a few years ago, they hydroceded and that area is a mess. Um, and the same thing also happened at my mother-in-law's when and she lives down on one of the other streets. So I'm not a big proponent of hydroseed. Um, if there's a way to do seeding and a combination of sodding to make it cost effective, I'm all for that. Um, I would just think there needs to be some education to residents because I didn't know that there was a, a forum as a resident to do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. I, yeah, I appreciate the comment. Um, I think uh, moving forward, we would be trying to, to manage those sorts of situations by um, having our specifications very clearly written if we intended to use hydro seed in a location to, and then also following up with the, the appropriate quality control or sorry, quality assurance um, measures like checking the seed mix and, and making sure. And then if there was an issue, then we would, you know, come back and, and, um, and review that. Uh, often, you know, we do the inspections that we, that we do on, on projects following up within the warranty period. Um, sometimes if we're outside the warranty period, um, we also very much appreciate if residents have concerns about the projects that we've we've undertaken. If uh, if there are concerns, we're we're very appreciative of receiving those phone calls to be made aware of them as well. Okay, thank you. And I do I do know firsthand the amount of work and and uh, 
watering and fertilizing and everything it is to maintain sod. So uh, not that I have it in my yard, but uh, the fields look nice when it's done. So uh, that's good. Okay, any other questions or comments from council? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion before, or a recommendation before us then. Um, what's the, Councillor Townsend? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, through you, I motion to, I move to uh, receive the report and adopt the recommendation. Okay, so moved, seconded, Councillor Porter. Uh, mover, any comment? Seeing none, seconder. Yes, um, I, I'd just like to say thank you very much for this report and I, I appreciate the initiative to bring cost saving measures forward. So keep them coming. <laughs> Agreed, thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? And motion is carried, thank you. Moving on to 4.2 and this, <clears throat> so this is the one Councillor Porter declared the conflict on. So I just making note of that for the record. Um, so was there a presentation for this one as well for council? Yes, Mr. Chairman. So again, Ms. Campbell will do the presentation for this one as well. Okay, proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you. I'll just share my screen again quickly. Sorry, can everyone see that? Yes, I can okay. see. Okay, um, thank you. So I am now here to talk about uh, development security requirements. Um, so the review of this policy was intended to be with respect to our site plan developments and um, I, I wasn't planning to discuss our um, subdivision security requirements tonight. Um, so uh, the site plan developments are, site, are developments that happen on uh, parcels of land owned within the site plan control area. So typically um, commercial or industrial properties or multi-residential properties. Um, we collect a development security as a performance security. So it's held by the township um, as a condition of the site plan agreement. And um, we require as per our current policy, 20% security for on-site works. Um, so on-site works are things that are happening on the parcel of land that is owned by the private entity. Um, we do not allow partial releases for securities uh, taken under this portion of the work. Um, and then we require a 100% security for offsite works, which are works that are happening within the township or county right of way. Um, so if someone was, was building something and they needed to um, tap into our water main or connect our entrance to the roadway and those sorts of things, uh, where they're doing work within our right of way or the county's right of way, we hold securities uh, for that work in, in the amount of 100% of the, the work that's being done. Um, we, we don't have a warranty holdback um, for our securities. So some, some areas, some municipalities hold back, um, you know, for example, 10% uh, for a year after the project is done to ensure that the, the work is, is uh, is uh, satisfactory through the, the one year period for the holdback period. We don't do that. The township received a number of requests for partial release of site plan securities in 2020. Those reports are attached to the report that you have in front of you. Um, we did a review of neighboring municipalities and generally found the following to be the, require, the required security. So, uh, the majority were required a 50% security for on-site works and a 100% security for off-site works, but they did allow partial release in some form um, partway through the project as work progressed. Um, 
most or many of those neighboring municipalities also required uh, the warranty holdback of generally of 10% um, for a period of one year following completion. I just wanted to update that I received some information from the town of Greater Napanee right before the meeting. Um, so the, that update is that their site plan securities, uh, they, re they require 10% for on-site works and 100% for off-site works. They do not allow partial releases um, and they do not require a warranty holdback. So um, that was timely information that I just received from them late this afternoon. Um, so the recommendation here is that staff does not recommend any changes to this policy, but we did want to bring this to council to have a discussion um, because there were so many requests in 2020 um, for security, uh, partial security releases for site plants. Um, if council chooses to deviate from the current policy, there are um, four options that we've um, noted that uh, could be considered. Um, so the first two, um, we recommend that if you, if you decide to alter the policy to allow partial releases, that the release is never less than 100% of the works left to be completed on site. So the example that I gave in the report, I think was um, if there was a fence that had to, um, that, that cost $10,000 to be constructed that had not yet been constructed, then um, we wouldn't recommend releasing funds. Uh, we wouldn't recommend releasing, or we would recommend that you continue to always hold at least that $10,000 sorry, um, that you would hold that at least that $10,000 um, until that work was complete. Um, and so option one and option two are presented. It's just that option one would allow that to happen for any site plan project and option two would only allow that to happen when those securities for a phase one project, for example, are being rolled into a phase two project. And that was provided because that's something that council did choose to do last year on one of the, the requests that was made. Um, the third option is that council could choose to alter the security requirements for on-site works. However, staff uh, does not recommend uh, going lower than 20% securities. And then the fourth option that's presented is to include a warranty period as some other municipalities uh, do, but again, that wasn't part of the recommendation in this case. Oops. Sorry. Um, so that's everything I had, but I am again happy to answer any questions or give some more information as part of a discussion. Okay. Thank you for that presentation. Um, so I'll open it up to Council. Any questions or comments on the uh, report or the presentation? Seeing none, I, I do have one question for staff. Um, in the past, as you mentioned, there have been some cases where um, it came to council and council did make the decision to uh, modify or do a partial release or a roll over into a second phase um, on a one-off basis. That would still be an option if, if it stayed status quo, that would still be an option. It would just be a, um, on a case by case basis, would it? Um, yes, that's correct. So any, any developer could approach council um, with, with any of those types of requests still. I would just note that um, if, count, if, the, if the decision by council is to change something that is outlined in the development agreement that between the township and the developer, then it's the responsibility of the developer to have the amending agreement um, completed and registered on title. So that financial responsibility is of the developer, not the township. So um, anytime those changes are made, it, it, result, it results in costs to the, to the developer as well. Okay, thank you for that information. <clears throat> okay, so back to council, is there, any other comments then or questions for our staff? Seeing none, um, we have a recommendation. We also have uh, 
options for consideration that uh, was mentioned in the presentation. So what would council's wishes? Councillor Townsend. I move to receive the report and adopt the recommendation. So moved, S seconded. I call a second time. Is there a seconder for the motion? There. Quick question. Um, is is that a, a change option number one, basically, uh, Councillor Townen, of the four options? No, it's it's to it's to have the securities policy remain as as it is, which is the rec which is the recommendation. I will second that. Yes. Okay. So That's what I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Budrick. Um, mover, any comment? Seeing none, seconder. I just I like the fact that if there's something where we, we get into a situation that uh, does make sense, um, and we know that uh, the developer is moving forward, I, I like to be able to work with people. That's all. But yes, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parks. Sorry, I won't be supporting this motion. Um, I think we need to be a little bit more open um, to development and to do that, I think we need to go with the uh, option number one. So I won't be supporting the motion as it stands. Okay, thank you. Okay, back to the mover for final comment. Seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. And motion is carried. Thank you for the presentations this evening. Item 4.3, Backyard Hen Draft Bylaw Review. And I believe there's a presentation for this one as well. Uh, yes, there is a chair. Uh, the deputy clerk uh, will be doing the presentation for this one. Okay, there we are. Hello. Hi. You can I'm just going you're there. to share my screen here if that's okay. Okay. Uh, does everyone see that okay? I can see it, yes. Okay. Um, okay, so this is this presentation is just a um, brief overview of the report, um, a recap of the findings from the um, public consultation, and then a highlight of the draft bylaw. Uh, so the topic of backyard hens has been before council numerous times um, since 2016. In October 28th, 2019, a regular council meeting after public consultation and a follow-up report to council, council made the following resolution uh, that staff uh, prepare a bylaw to regulate backyard hens in the township. Um, so after a summer of public consultation, um, there was a survey prepared and made available from July 15th, 2019 through to August 30th, 2019. The survey was available online at various locations throughout the township by paper or could be mailed to residents with a return envelope. In addition to the survey, three public engagement sessions were held throughout the township. Uh, there was one in Odessa, one in Amherstview and one in Bath. The public consultation um, provided residents with the history of staff reports that had gone to council regarding backyard hens and options that were being looked into to regulate backyard hens in Loyalist Township. A total of 566 surveys were completed online and 15 paper copies were received. So this is just a brief summary of the survey results. Um, so if you have a look through uh, one of the 
these are, were kind of the two main questions that we proposed. Uh, are you in favor of the township permitting backyard hens in urban and rural areas through a licensing program? Um, if you look at it, it, it appears that a majority were in favor of only allowing in rural and uh, rural areas with proper zoning. However, if you look at the next question, um, please check which option you were in favor of. So remaining status quo, so no bylaw regulating backyard hens, so they could essentially be in urban and rural areas. Uh, begin a pilot program allowing residents to own backyard hens for the next two years through a licensing program or prohibit the ownership of backyard hens through a bylaw. A majority um, seem to be in favor of allowing them in urban and rural areas. So some of the um, questions in the survey were asking uh, what were the biggest concerns or why would people be in favor of allowing backyard hens? So this is just a brief summary of comments um, not in favor. So the people were concerned about noise, smell, proximity to lot lines, rats and predators. Um, some of the comments from residents who are in favor of backyard hens, uh, they say it's a sustainable food source, teaches families about where food comes from, will help cut down on waste as less kitchen scraps go into landfills, and they can potentially assist with controlling tick populations in the area. So the current status is um, there's no bylaw regulating backyard hens. The only way to regulate is through a noise bylaw and clean yards bylaw. So if we get a complaint about um, a, re a rooster, we can address that. If they are keeping backyard hens in an unsanitary condition, we can address that. Um, this does not allow the township to address issues such as animal welfare, proximity of hens to neighbors, number of hens on a property and the proper disposal of deceased hens. Bylaw does receive calls ranging from inquiries about owning backyard chickens to nuisance complaints. Um, it should be noted too, since the pandemic started, we've had numerous calls um, inquiring if backyard hens are permitted. So just a brief overview of the draft bylaw. Um, several municipalities across Ontario have successfully permitted hens to be kept in residential areas. This includes small rural municipalities as well as those that are very large and urban. A, a review of these bylaws was completed and used to develop the draft bylaw being presented. The intent of the bylaw is to provide regulations on keeping of backyard hens to ensure it is done without causing nuisance to neighboring properties and to ensure the safety and well being of hens and owners. Uh, this would be a licensing bylaw where those interested in obtaining a backyard hen uh, license will be required to play through to apply through an application license and pay a licensing fee. Um, the licensing free is, fee is pretty um, small and it's basically in place to recoup any costs through enforcement and administrative processes. Um, so just a highlight of the draft bylaw, um, these are more so of the regulations within it. Um, so it would be a maximum of six chickens uh, all chickens should be at least four months old. Uh, the reason for, for them being four months old is so that um, people know the gender of the chicken because roosters would be prohibited. Um, so it would save them from, if they were to get them when they're newborn, you don't know if it's going to be a rooster or a hen. Um, all deceased chickens shall be disposed of promptly in a sanitary manner. This includes bringing to a veterinarian farm, a baiter, or other operation that is lawfully permitted to dispose of chickens. Slaughtering of chickens on the property is prohibited. Selling uh, eggs, manure, any other by byproducts derived from chickens is prohibited. Chickens must be kept in coops from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, chickens must be kept in an enclosed hen run when not in their coop. Uh, food should be stored in an enclosed non-penetrable container. Uh, chickens caged only when actively transporting the chicken. And everyone who obtains a license must ensure there's good husbandry practices. Each hen is provided with food, unfrozen water, shelter, adequate light, ventilation, warmth, veterinary care, opportunities to scratch, peck, peck dust, bathe, roost, and socialize with their own kind. Um, under this bylaw, um, any, any farms uh, under the zoning bylaw would be exempt from this bylaw. 
Uh, within a residential area, no backyard coop or outdoor run shall be located within front or side yards. Uh, there are setback requirements as outlined here. So three meters from all windows and doors, uh, 1.2 meters from any lot line and five meters from wells and septic tanks, 15 meters from any lot line on which a school is located and 7.5 from any church or business. Uh, one backyard coop and hen run shall be permitted per property. And all backyard hen coop shall be fully enclosed weatherproof structure or enclosure with ventilation and heat source built to prevent rodents um, or any predators. Um, and then within the coop, um, one nest box for every three egg laying hens, one perch giving eight to 12 inches of space per hen, um, 0 0.3 meters squared of floor area for each hen and coop shall not, not exceed two meters in height and at least um, 10 square foot of roofed outdoor enclosure. So adopting a bylaw to regulate backyard hens, um, some advantages and disadvantages. So an advantage, it's an enforceable bylaw in case complaints are received, um, provides fresh and sustainable food source. Manure can be composted and used to fertilize garden, gardens, provides educational lessons regarding food production and accommodates residents' interest in having hens with regulations to protect um, neighbors and animals. Some of the disadvantages, uh, perceived nuisance issues such as odor and noise, potential to attract predators and rodents, increase in township resources, housing and or disposal for abandoned and or seized, seized hens could be an issue, and potential conflict with neighbors. Um, so when reviewing other municipalities, um, we created a list of municipalities not per permitting backyard hens. Um, some of them went through public consultations and others have just, um, they haven't allowed them. Uh, there are numerous cities who have done pilot programs. So most notably Toronto and city of Kingston went through this and Kingston has successfully been running a backyard hen program uh, for quite some time now. Uh, and then examples of municipalities permitting um, backyard hens. So if you, if you look through the list, a lot of the regulations and setbacks are very similar. Um, so on this slide, there's just a summary of the provisions relating to urban hens in those municipalities who, who permit them. And that's it for the presentation. If there's any questions, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen here. Thank you. Unless, unless anyone wants to go back to a slide. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so I'll open it up to council. Any questions or comments? Councillor Porter, please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you very much. This uh, this surfaced a while back uh, due to a, several complaints from uh, residents in Odessa. If you recall, there was a rat infestation and um, they, they wanted to know about a neighbor that had chickens and it kind of just got the ball rolling on all of this. And my thought, like I, I read the draft bylaw and it's not clear and, and uh, if it, it mentions lands that are zoned for agricultural purposes. There's many rural residents that live on five acres or three acres and far away from neighbors. So can you tell me the way this is written, is that township wide or is it just in suburban settlement areas that this applies to? Um, so the bylaw would be township wide with the exception of property zoned um, as farmland. The, the thought process was behind it that most fam you know, families who live on five, six acres, um, if they're having backyard hens, they're typically for personal consumption. Um, so the, the bylaw would be across the board regarding size. So it would be for both urban and rural. 
so explain to me, um, personal, I, maybe I missed that, um, or I was reading when you mentioned it. I'm sorry if I did miss it. So if it's not for, if it is for personal consumption, then you're exempt from the bylaw. Is that, that what you're saying there? Uh, no, I, if it was for, um, if it was, if you're zoned as farmland, you would be exempt from the bylaw. Um, it would, the, the bylaw would apply to any property across the board. Uh, whether it's urban or or um, rural. Okay, so, I, so I, sorry, uh, Councilor Porter, I could maybe just uh, clarify a little bit on that. Uh, okay. Anybody who who is zoned rural uh, would fall under the zoning for, or, yeah, sorry, under the agricultural side would be able to uh, do uh, you know the the natural farming practices with chickens. Uh, this backyard hens is based on personal use, so somebody who's looking to uh, have a couple uh, hens in their yard for uh, fresh eggs, um, that type of thing. Okay, because um, it does mention zoned agricultural, and I just want to make that point that there's many rural residential zonings in the rural community that are not zoned agricultural. Uh, yes, you can so have a farm and you can farm your land and not be zoned agricultural. So maybe that language needs to be looked at. Um, if, if you look at the zoning map, there's lots of large farms that are on uh, uh, rural zone, rural residential zone, but they're not zoned agricultural. So the, the intent, in my mind, the intent was originally, um, you know, to, to look at how we can accommodate people in uh, built up areas um, and, and regulate that some, somehow. Um, my thought, it wasn't the intent to uh, restrict people in the rural areas um, that are, you know, a couple acres or five acres or whatever that have done it for years. And, uh, you know, my, my fear with the way it's worded now is that they would fall into the position of having to apply um, and, and follow all these uh, rules when, you know, they've been doing it for years and quite successfully without complaint. <clears throat> Yes, through the through the chair. Uh, so the the I believe under the uh, zoning bylaw under anybody who is not zoned um, agriculturally, uh, if we got a complaint and we're sending them out, they would not, and they were actually farming uh, and they're not zoned for that. Uh, we would be uh, looking at them for being, uh, you know, uh, acting outside of the, the zoning bylaw. So this would allow them still to have the chickens, but it would be within the parameters of what the bylaw would, would permit. Yeah, so I can't support the bylaw then because um, the intent was not to restrict um, our rural residents. The intent was to find a way to accommodate our um, uh, urban residents in, and in built up areas. That, that was my uh, understanding. Um, people that have lived rurally, um, to me, don't need additional regulations to tell them how to raise their chickens or how to, uh, whether they're allowed to or not. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Townsend. Um, I, I had a question. I want to come back to Councillor Porter's question, but I had one question about uh, within the bylaw, <clears throat> whether the, um, uh, whether it is implied within the bylaw that the coops are sedentary as opposed to movable chicken tractors, which, which are essentially a coop and hooped area that can move uh, you know, basically the idea is that chickens can get fresh grass. Now in a small little backyard in the middle of uh, Amherstfield, you probably wouldn't be doing that, but you might be doing that somewhere else. And is that, is the intent of the bylaw that, that the coop and run are sedentary fixed uh, infrastructure? Uh, no, the bylaw does not speak to that. Um, if they are meeting the setback requirements in coop size, uh, there would be no reason that they wouldn't be able to do that. Okay. Thank you. Did you have another, Councillor Townsend? 
I did. So in reference to uh, Councillor Porter's comments, which which are, are good ones, because, um, you know, if you're, as, as Councillor Porter alludes to, if, if you are someone in a rural area that, um, you know, has been has uh, has been doing uh, e um, egg production for a while, you may have, for instance, a flock of, of 30 hens. Uh, and you may actually be selling eggs at your farm gate, um, which, you know, is 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 technically fine for you to do. I mean, under the, as most people will be aware, the egg industry is a supply managed sector. So, uh, but the quota exemption is for up to a hundred hens, and you can sell at your farm gate uh, legally within that within that system. And so you may, you may actually, as Councillor Porter says, catch people that are currently doing a farm gate uh, egg sale. Um, and if this bylaw applies to them, then they could have a flock reduced to six, in which case that, uh, that plummets their sales quite substantially. So I guess I'm trying to ask the clerk and the deputy clerk if there is a way in which we can I don't know, accommodate for that for that fact. I mean, I, I would like to see the bylaw go forward in the in the sense that I, I, I completely agree with what it's trying to do. And I think it's I think it's good to have some enforcement uh, capability over it, but it, it's a good point that Councillor Porter raises. And so I'm trying to to figure out what we do about that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chapman? Uh, yeah, so we'll take that into consideration. Again, this is just being presented. We can look at, um, you know, wording in regards to the rural area, um, especially in the rural or, or into a, a size uh, more than, uh, you know, what's in the uh, more in the urban area. So we'll take that information back and try and uh, come up with uh, some wording or, or another option to present. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from council? Councillor Boudrick? Uh, I know we, this has been brought up many times for, as uh, the deputy clerk had mentioned, and I know there was wording a while back that they were talking about a one acre lot minimum size for this to possibly go forward. And I mean, it's something we could talk about um, going forward if this is how we wanna have things go. Um, but again, it comes back to what the clerk's saying about possibly how changing some wording could make this go forward. Just a comment, that's all. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other, Councillor Porter? Yeah, I just, I just want to add to Councillor Guterek's remark is that, you know, if there is a minimum lot size like one acre, it may alleviate a lot of neighborly disputes for those that live in close proximity to each other. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's a good idea to look at. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Any other comments or from council? Um, okay, seeing none, I'm just gonna make a quick comment that this is one item that I have heard about um, not, regularly but somewhat routinely <laughs> and uh, most of the people I know they do it very well uh, if, if they are into chickens they know what they're doing they keep the feed in steel containers they you'd never know the animals were there really um, but then there's others that um, still have some education to to be able to do it properly so um, I think there's some good points where um, there are also, I can think of other people that do have like five or 10 acres. They do raise some birds, um, do it well. To be honest with you, I don't know what all the numbers are, but certainly could accommodate more than six. So there's some, been some good points raised here. So um, I think it's been good uh, discussion. Um, I just, I have a question for the clerk or the deputy clerk with the conversation that's gone on the the uh, recommendation is for it to come back to uh, for a public meeting 
um, at a council meeting. With the comments that have that have been mentioned here, would it be preferred by staff if it came back to another committee of the whole to be able to have a discussion, or would we prefer to go to the public meeting and uh, um, it'd be at the call council's decision tonight, which it would be, but I wasn't sure if there was enough discussion that it would warrant at another committee of the whole from, from staff's perspective. Um, I think uh, through the chair, I think what we could do is have a report for March uh, 22nd, um, just outlining the, the proposals or the options that have been uh, spoken about tonight. Um, I don't know that we'd be able to have that for the March 8th, just because of our timing. So uh, it would go, it could come to the March um, 22nd council meeting as a report and then have a, an outline then of when the public meeting would be. Okay. So that's, that's one option then. Yes. For the, for tonight. Okay. Thank you. So if there's no further comments or questions, uh, entertain a motion from council. Councilor Porter. Yes, so I'll move to receive the staff report and um, direct that uh, staff take into consideration the comments made tonight from council and that another draft come back to council on um, March 22nd. So moved, second, Councillor Townsend. Um, any further comments from the mover? Seeing none, seconder, Councillor Townsend. Just that I'm appreciative to staff for all the work <laughs> that they've put into this, and I know it's going going back again. But I mean, uh, I think it's all 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 good to to um, to get it really good and precise. Obviously, as a as a a long time uh, <laughs> chicken man myself, uh, I'm I'm you know I'm in favor of the principle of what it's trying to do. So just uh, another little tweak. Very good. Thank you. Um, any other comments from council? Seeing none, I'm just gonna make a comment that I, I echo Councillor Townend's uh, comments that uh, staff have put a lot of time and a lot of research into this and it's greatly appreciated. Um, much like Councillor Townsend, somebody who has raised chickens, worked on chicken farms as well as others, um, there is a science to it. And I think, it, I think education for agriculture is always good as long as it's done properly. So I, I, I appreciate staff doing this. So with that, if there's uh, back to the mover for final comment, nothing, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion is carried, thank you. So scrolling, <laughs> okay. So item 4.4, reserve and reserve fund policy update. And I believe there's a presentation on this as well. Uh, Mr. Dickey, are you? Yeah, yes, yeah, so I'll um, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'll just introduce um, the deputy treasurer is going to do the, a presentation for council just just very briefly. This is uh, there's there'll be two policies we're looked at. The first one is a an update of a reserve and reserve fund policy, which was last updated by council in 2014. So just at a high level, uh, and the deputy will explain all this. But um, it's kind of exciting because council has passed a strategic plan, and in there is built you know uh, some good initiatives around asset management and good financial planning. So, so these two policies that we'll be looking at tonight, the, the reserve fund and reserve one and the um, operating surplus and deficit policy will both, both um, help council uh, establish a really good solid policy framework to help us, to help council in, in meeting some of these um, strategic initiatives, particularly in the area of uh, financial planning and asset management. So. Um, yeah, so the, the senior financial analyst and the deputy have done a fair bit of research and work and, and develop these for council uh, to take a look at. So appreciate your any comments or feedback tonight. So um, I'll pass it over to the deputy. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, all right. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, so I'll share my screen now and uh, we'll get the party started.
Do, 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 do. Everyone can see that, I assume? I can, yes. So as uh, Steve mentioned, we have uh, reports 4.4 and 4.5. Uh, there's the update to the reserve fund policy, and then we're proposing a new policy around the surplus and deficit management. Um, we've prepared just one presentation that will encompass both reports because that's how efficient finance is. So I don't want to bore you with two. Um, so as Steve mentioned, the first one is uh, an update to the reserve fund uh, lab policy, which was last done in 2014. And the, uh, the goals of this update was really to provide some cleanup, create some new reserves and reserve funds, as well as uh, setting some targets for the reserves. And then the preparing of the, uh, the proposal of the surplus and deficit management policy would be new to the township, but it's an important policy going forward, which I'll explain as we uh, move along. So, um, and as Steve mentioned, Brianne or McNevin, our senior financial analyst has worked a lot on this and she is here to answer any questions later in case I'm not able to, um, just put that out there. So we're gonna start with the uh, surplus and deficit management policy. Um, so the big part of this and why this is exciting for us finance people is currently we don't have this in place. So what that means is when we have a surplus or a deficit in any given year, it kind of sits on note 12 of our financial statements, as I'm sure everyone knows all our notes inside and out on our audited statements. And it kind of stays hidden there. And we only really use it on an ad hoc basis where if we need funds for something, we would come to council and say, hey, can we use some of that surplus that it's kind of hidden away that a lot of people don't know about and we need it for this purpose. So the idea of this policy, um, and it's a common policy amongst a lot of municipalities, is the earmark it at year end that if there is a surplus or a deficit, um, that you target specific reserves that are set up for specific purposes and put in a policy. And the goal of that, it, it creates accountability and it really aligns with the strategic policies as uh, um, Mr. Dickey mentioned earlier. So what we're proposing, you'll see there's a general rate and a utilities, um, they're kind of matching because Utilities has its own accumulated surplus and deficits due to the service rates. And then the general rate would be our tax operating surpluses. So what we're proposing is in general rate, 30% um, of a surplus would go to a general tax stabilization reserve. 30% would go to a general capital reserve, 10% to the working capital, which currently exists, which is the working fund. Um, and then 30% essentially would be kind of like a flex allocation where depending on the needs of the time, um, we can really be a little more flexible with that extra 30% and target a specific reserve or other reserve funds that aren't here, depending on council's priorities at the time. Or for example, if tax stabilization reserve had been really deple depleted in the current year, you might wanna put extra in there if there was a surplus to build it back up towards its target. So it just provides for uh, more flexibility in that way. Um, utilities is set up similar um, and that 30% would go to a utility rate stabilization, 40 to a Typically I have bad internet, but I think we just lost the deputy, did we not? Okay. <laughs> it's pretty bad when you're trying to figure out, is it mine or is it someone else's? <laughs> I think I'm the same thing. Bill, are you there? Uh, so I don't see him there. Um, We can give him just a minute to see if he can get signed back in. It might have just been a glitch in his internet or it could be gone. Uh, Mr. Chair, he just uh, texted that um, Brianne will have to finish it uh, as his internet is uh, acting up. It's down? Okay. Yes. So, I'm glad you're here then. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are you are you able to uh, carry on then, 
with yep. the presentation? Okay. Uh, yes, Chair, just one moment. I'm just going to share my screen again. Okay. My apologies. Okay, everyone can see this okay? I can, yes, so. Okay, great. Okay, so just um, uh, to kind of follow up on um, Mr. Renier's, uh, where Mr. Renier's went off. Um, again, utilities also has that flex um, proportion that uh, council can, uh, council and directors can also kind of utilize uh, depending on how reserves and reserve funds will uh, deplete or add during the year. So uh, overall that is basically what we're proposing in the policy is pretty straightforward. And then all, on the deficit side, although staff does typically come to council with some, um, you know, major overages in the year that may occur, and we propose a funding plan based on that. Uh, we also have a clause within the policy that says that if we do kind of have some overages that the general tax and utilities rate stabilizations would cover it depending on where those overages actually occur. So that's basically the surplus management policy in a nutshell. Um, and we also have some recommendations in the staff report that kind of kickstarts those reserve and reserve funds. Um, so based on the audited uh, operating surplus in 2019, uh, we are proposing that we kind of divvy that out based on the proposed policy. Uh, and as you can see in the general tax stabilization and general capital reserve funds, we do have some improvements to make if the proposed targets in the reserve and reserve fund policy are approved. Um, you can see that as of 2019, we are proposing a three to 5% of general tax levy as a target, as we will talk about more in the reserve and reserve fund policy update. Um, we're, we'd be currently at one and a half percent general capital, two to 4% is the target for asset replacement value. And if we do the proposed allocation in the staff report, we're looking at only being at around 0.6%. Uh, working fund, we are, we would be at the target as of 2019 and same with utilities. Um, again, you know, those reserve and reserve funds can fluctuate from year to year, depending on what we have planned or what we propose and council have approved to use them on. Uh, for example, we did have some major proposals in 2020 and 2021 to the utilities capital reserve fund, more, uh, more specifically the club fee. So although we are meeting the target now, there might be some years where depending on our inflow of club fees or our contribution to capital, um, we may see some dips in there as well. But overall, utilities is in a bit better shape than general rate based on obviously the rate increases we've seen uh, in the last few years to try to uh, alleviate some of that uh, infrastructure gap. So that is surplus management. Uh, moving on to reserve and reserve fund policy, I just wanted to refresh you um, on some definitions uh, relating to the reserve and reserve funds. So a reserve um, is, is actually segregated as equity on the financial statements and in our financial system. Um, they do not get an interest allocation and they're included in our general bank account. Um, they can be earmarked for certain projects by council. Um, but they aren't restricted by bylaw or legislation. A reserve fund would have a separate bank account um, and it would have an interest allocation based on the categories I will be speaking to later on. Um, again, there would be a specific purpose for the fund and typically there might be you know, a legislation, a bylaw or a resolution associated with the usage. Um, moving on within reserve funds, we have obligatory reserve funds. Um, those are typically externally restricted. So, you know, you would see your development charges, your parkland, your federal gas tax, provincial gas tax, those kind of things. 
Um, and contributions have to be deferred, which means they are recognized as a liability on the financial statements until the stipulations of the legislation or agreement have been met. So um, it doesn't get recognized as income until the monies have been spent accordingly. Discretionary reserve funds are typically um, internally discretionary by council. They're earmarked for a specific purpose and they uh, would be recognized as income because we there are no external stipulations associated with it. Even though council may want to earmark it for a project, it still gets recognized as income, even though it might not be spent till you know one or two or ten years later. A new aspect um, in the reserve fund policy update is a revolving reserve. So there are a couple of revolving reserves that you will see in the proposed update. Um, they are internally established to fund normal course operating requirements, and it's proposed that um, they do not require the usage does not require council approval, provided they conform with the intent of the overall uh, reserve. So, the, for example, you will see that will be like winter control um, or some fire department related uh, reserves that typically. Uh, if it's within, you know, the spending of winter control and they're experiencing a deficit in the year due to weather fluctuations, for example, then uh, you know we can go ahead and, and bring that those monies in, uh, or I guess technically a transfer um, to cover that deficit. So this slide um, really just summarizes the categorical changes uh, from the 2014 policy. At a high level, it really isn't much of a difference. Um, it does still conform with how our bank accounts are currently set up and still allows us to segregate our funds accordingly uh, so that we could provide uh, accurate information to council in terms of what we're seeing within our discretionary reserve funds, what we're seeing in our asset replacement reserve funds, and then our overall reserves. So um, I believe that's appendix one of the staff report, associate staff report. We are also proposing to formally dissolve some reserves uh, and reserve funds. Some of them at the end of the day don't really make much of a difference. We just have noticed them on the past 2014 policy and uh, staff could not locate any subsequent dissolution or formal dissolution. So the first three bath hydro sale reserve fund Bath Community Group Reserve Fund and Waterside Series. Uh, those are all uh, reserves or reserve funds that were set up for a specific purpose years ago and activities no longer relevant. Funds have been transferred there no, and there is no uh, outstanding uh, monies in, within the funds. So we are requesting to formally dissolve them. Light up the season reserve uh, does have a balance of about $3,300. We're proposing that the uh, monies get transferred to the general tax stabilization reserve as activity has not occurred in many years uh, within that reserve. Light up the season activities um, typically have a net cost and uh, the generate has been absorbing that for the last few years. Youth program reserve has a proposed balance of $900. Again, have not seen activity within the reserve. Um, I believe it was the jumpstart program at one time. So we are also proposing that uh, those monies get transferred to the general tax stabilization reserve. Okay, so moving on to the major changes within the policy update. Um, so first I am moving right on to category B, which is our discretionary and restricted reserve funds. Uh, the first one is landfill obligations. This one was originally the violet landfill specifically. Uh, we're proposing to expand it to all landfills, including the Amherst Island landfills, with uh, transfer with our overall target to be based on the forecasted closure and post-closure costs. So we do have a consultant that tells us what the present value of the closure and post-closure costs are on that on those landfills. So we are able to forecast the future value uh, of that uh, closure, and we can. Um, make adjusted contributions based on council's approval to eventually hopefully meet that large cash outflow when the time comes to make those closures and incur those monitoring costs. 
There's also accumulated allocations sitting in our general bank account that were previously budgeted over the years of $479,000 that we want to formally move to the reserve fund out of the general bank account. Prepaid local charge is the next one. Uh, this one was originally Amherst Drive frontage fees. Um, we are proposing to expand it to all prepaid local charge related agreements uh, so that we can um, be able to bring in some other local charges that may come down the pipeline that we can automatically segregate to a separate reserve fund and we will still be able to segregate them uh, internally to ensure that um, we are charging the proper charge. Um, the next one, industrial and business parks. This is just merely a name change. We do have uh, activity related to the Taylor Kid uh, Industrial Park and the Loyalist East Business Park. So we want to ensure that uh, it is properly included within the name. Lastly, for category B, um, we want to formally reorganize the uh, impost fee reserve funds. So right now they are currently based on service area. So we have a bath water, a bath sewer, a loyalist east, east sewage and a fair filled water. Um, but since we have been harmonized starting in 2015, I believe um, it would make more sense logically to segregate impost fees between club fee and growth fee and also between water and sewer. So we would have a water club fee, sewer club fee, a water growth fee and a sewer growth fee. Um, so our target for the impost club would be two to four percent of the replacement value combined with capital replacement reserve funds. Um, as you may recall, whenever we did our connection start study, we identified those club fees to be um, a recovery of uh, the user revenue in term to fund capital replacement, uh, basically their fee to join the club um, on existing capacity. So that those impost fees, the club side of impost fees will eventually seize between the year 2030 and 2035 based on um, how much we get in before then. Uh, so it is important that we combine the club fee with the actual capital replacement reserve funds to uh, get the target because we will see um, a reduction around that time in our cash inflow for those. Um, moving on to category D, asset management. So general capital, this was originally called the municipal capital, municipal general capital reserve fund. Uh, we just want to uh, change it to general rate, general capital, which is basically general rate capital. Um, this is the reserve fund that is associated with the surplus and deficit management policy and the proposed allocation within the, uh, that, sorry, the proposed allocation within that policy. Um, again, we're looking at two to 4% of general rate asset replacement value, which is uh, a common target in some other municipalities that we've seen. We also want to create a new fleet and equipment reserve fund, which um, is just a segregation from the general capital. We have been contributing to our fleet uh, in the past few years, and we just want to clearly identify uh, those contributions. And since we do have a significant amount of fleet replacements each year, as we've typically seen, so we are um, proposing to just combine it between general rate and utilities to simplify it keep them segregated um, and there would be the associated transfer from general capital based on the contributions made to date plus the, in, the proportioned interest earned um, and then the funding source would be uh, operating allocations as we've always done and then if they and if council or staff ever wanted to propose to, fl to flex some additional contributions they can definitely do that as all reserve funds. Um, we do are we are proposing a target of 1.5 to 2 million on that fund, which um, is what we've seen. It kind of varies depending on the municipality and their level of fleet, but that appears to be appropriate based on what we are projecting for replacements in the next 10 years. Um, utilities capital, same thing, mirrors general capital would be segregated between water and sewer. Um, and again, is part of the surplus 
and deficit management policy on those annual allocations. Uh, the next one, query re rehabilitation and post-closure. Um, again, a name change for inclusion. Um, we are proposing to transfer accumulated allocations that are actually sitting in our general account, um, similar to the landfill for $314,000. And at this time, we do not have a target determined. Heritage preservation, uh, is another one that we're proposing to include in the policy. However, council did previously approve this, um, the establishment of this policy and it's intended to preserve and maintain heritage capital. And the main funding source we presume will be receipt issued donations, uh, but again, target not yet determined. And it is because we have uh, a planned assessment uh, coming up to identify all of our heritage properties within the township. Reserves, last one, uh, general, tax, general tax stabilization. So this is part of the surplus management policy. This is technically new, it's a stabilization tool. Some examples of the intended uses would be one-time or temporary cost, unbudgeted, unanticipated cost, uh, contingent costs. So for example, we did propose the use of an integrity commissioner, which is would be contingent, we aren't sure what the outflow will actually be. Um, so those are the types of things that we could say, we, we don't want to bake into our general tax rate. We obviously want to fund it. We don't know what the projection is and it's not necessarily permanent. So we would propose the use of a general tax stabilization. Uh, the target is very common in other municipalities we've seen and we've proposed three to 5% of general rate tax levy. Working funds, that is uh, a reserve we do currently do have. Um, we kind of want to switch it over now that we have the tax stabilization that our intended use would be merely for immediate cash flow obligations to alleviate the need for short-term borrowing. Um, again, a target that is quite common within working funds is five to 25% of gross general rate operating expenditures. Winter control is a new uh, long awaited reserve, I believe. Um, it is a stabilization tool. The funding source would be the, an annual operating surplus in winter control. Um, so that will help uh, the smoothing of our winter control budget from year to year. And for years that we have significant weather, uh, we can, we may be able to take from that reserve. And then on years that we don't have as uh, as bad a weather that we could maybe contribute back or replenish that reserve. Um, target is 25 to 30% of the three year average winter control costs. Utilities rate stabilization mirrors the general tax stabilization. The target is a bit higher um, proposed at five to 10% of gross operating expenditures. Um, that's just due to the volatility and what we may see in unanticipated costs within utilities. Also, as we transition to a more consumption-based rate, um, it may help us uh, on years that we have, uh, you know, a, a dry summer or our consumption is down lower than what we anticipated. So um, we are proposing five to ten percent ferry reserve. It is a stabilization tool, so we are proposing to move it from a reserve fund and into a reserve. Same with uh, transit. Um, so that's just kind of a formality to mirror how we are doing our other stabilizations. Fire Training Center and General Fire Department. Um, these are emergency services uh, reserves. One of them was a reserve fund and we want to classify it as a revolving reserve. So it would be at the discretionary use of the Director of Emergency Services. Um, income is based on a uh, surplus associated with the fire training center and general fire department that's our new uh, proposed reserve and similar to what we've seen in query there is funds held in deferred revenue for 16,300 that should technically be within a reserve and not as deferred revenue recognized as income um, and again, the intended use would be discretionary by the Director of Emergency Services. There would be no operating allocation to that reserve. It would just 
uh, be unrestricted donations to the Loyalist Fire Department that they receive. Okay, getting to the end. Um, financial implications of uh, both policies. Um, the transfers that we propose in both staff reports will yield a transfer from the general bank account to reserve funds of approximately $1.9 million. Um, the general, so that, that means that our cash flow overall at general bank account where we pay most of our expenses throughout the year would be lower. However, our general bank account would be protected by the security deposits that we held. And then our other reserves, like our working capital and our stabilizations that would remain within the general bank account. Um, interest allocations, again, we would see, um, since we have a inflow planned to reserve funds, then we would also have an increase in allocated interest and interest earned within a reserve fund, which, will help, which would help us on the reserve fund side, most notably on our capital. Um, funds that we can use for our future replacements um, and to assist in closing that uh, infrastructure gap. So, um, however, surplus allocations to reserve funds will only occur by June 30th of the subsequent year. So there is some time in between when the, the transactions actually occur. Um, and then overall, just some non-financial and look at, well, non-financial and the I guess, um, realm of, of the strategic plan, which really is financial strategy. But we think that the uh, approval of these reserve funds, reserve fund policy update and the surplus management uh, new policy will greatly assist in uh, meeting some of the initiatives of our strategic plan. And it's essentially all of our financial strategies um, goals and uh, it also will help the finance department um, develop a streamlined reporting um, process to council where we can easily identify the funds that we have available, what's committed, what's not committed to be able to make some, for them to make some informed decisions um, on how, how they want to replenish those funds or use those funds. So um, again, it's just, it just kind of cleans things up and uh, helps us for the future. Sorry, that was very ad hoc, but um, yeah, that's all I have. Any questions? Uh, thanks, Brian. Sorry, I apologize for my internet. I am back um, to all the questions, but uh, perfect timing. So just trying to get my, there we go, my screen is back so I can see everybody. Um, great presentation, thank you for stepping in. Um, Ms. McNevin, you, uh, very seamless transition between the presenters, so that was great. Um, yes, Councillor Porter. Yes, a quick question about the presentation. Uh, did you do both reports? Uh, the reserve and reserve fund policy and the operating surplus and deficit management. I, I thought you did the operating de surplus and deficit management first. Am I mistaken? Or did you do both reports together? The, the presentation was a combination of both. So yeah, we spoke to the surplus policy first, um, but they are really intertwined. Um, but yeah, yeah, the, pre the presentation was for both reports, 4.4 and 4.5. Okay, thank you. I was just, I was worried that I wasn't following along properly. It's like, okay, um, I do have something further. And I know this is, this is a committee of the whole, uh, so I can make comment without asking question, um, less, less formal uh, set up here. But just wondering, I mean, we have not adopted the budget yet. And a lot of these numbers could be affected by, um, if there should be further budget deliberation or discussion. And I'm, I'm a little confused by the timing of this. And I'm not saying there's going to be further discussion or further de de uh, deliberation, but if there, if there were to be, um, a lot of this could be affected. And, and normally do we not, you know, look at this type of thing after a budget's been adopted? Uh, yeah, I, I can speak to that. So in, in terms, yeah, I, I can understand why 
might seem a little confusing. In terms of the bud, the proposed 2021 budget, there are proposed um, transfer allocations to reserves and reserve funds that currently exist. Um, that's why I mean, surplus, specifically the surplus policy, um, the recommendations around the accumulated surplus balance as of or December 31st, 2019. So that's the existing surplus that's already in our uh, financial statements as of the end of 2019. So it's really just allocating that. It doesn't speak because um, we, we don't have our statements yet for 2020. So we can't speak to that. Um, and then a lot of the, the things that we're formalizing within it are practices. Like we do allocations to capital through our budget. We do an allocation to the fleet reserve through our budget. So it's really just formalizing and continuing that in a more structured way that does provide more accountability and transparency. Um, and even, even in saying that in the proposed 2021 budget, there are um, allocations in from the working fund or from the surplus to cover things that, that this policy would be putting into the tax stabilization. So we already are kind of making use of that in the proposed policy, but it's more just formalizing it. I don't know if that clearly answers it, but. Okay, so just that I'm clear then. So, so all of this talks basically about the financial status or what happened in 2019 and, and none of this would tie our hands um, in, a, in future deliberations on the budget. And again, I don't, I don't wanna give anybody any ideas that there's going to be, but we need to be fully open um, to having lots of flexibility should there be further deliberations. So, you know, when we're allocating specific amounts to specific reserve funds, um, I guess I just want to be sure that this isn't tying our hands in any way, shape or form. No, no, it's certainly, certainly not. And part of the, um, in terms of the surplus specifically allocating the, you know, the 30 to the tax stabilization, 30 to the capital 10 to working fund and the 30 flexibility. Part of that is those reserve funds would be there as tools for things like budgets where you could, we could work into the budget. Hey, let's pull this out of those reserves to, you know, potentially stabilize tax rates and stuff like that. So there is a lot of flexibility within those reserves, even if the money does go into them. Um, any council resolution can in theory use what's in the reserves. So you're, you're definitely not um, limited in that way. It, it's really meant to tell us where to put it at year end, whereas instead of just leaving it in the financial statement note. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Any other questions or comments from council? And seeing none, just, just to take that one step further, um, Deputy, um, in, in very simple terms, and I guess I'm, I'm reading it that this is establishing our goals and not necessarily requirements going forward. So this is, we're looking at 2019, but in the future, even future councils, this would set goals of where we would like to maintain our, our, our uh, reserves then. Reserves. Exactly, their, their targets. Um, and it, it's important to say that when we have a target, if you fall, once we get to and establish a target and you fall below a target, best practice is to create a plan to try to get back there because it does serve a purpose. Um, but in saying that, um, within the updated policy on the reserve fund, um, it is in there under, I think it's section 4.9 review in the policy that the reserve fund policy be brought back or updated um, every four years or in the first year of council or as deemed necessary. So the thought is these policies really should be living documents. They don't just go away. And the idea behind that is, at least if we're reviewing every four years or for first year of council, you can really tie it to the strategic goals of council and what they're trying to achieve. Um, so that that that's an important part of it as well, because policies or strategies can change over time. So the policy needs to be able to adapt and reflect that. Okay, thank you. That would keep it relevant then to exactly. the status every, every term. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll just ask, bring it back one more time, if there's any questions or comments from council that they'd like to bring forward. Seeing none, um, I'll just uh, 
we do have, so dealing with 4.4, uh, the reserve and reserve fund policy update, there is a recommendation, 14 um, points in it. Um, so using that, going with that one, what would council's wishes be? Councillor Townsend? I move to receive the report and adopt recommendations one through 14. Thank you, so moved. Seconder, do we have second for that? I think Councillor Porter. Thank you. Uh, mover, uh, comments? Seeing none, seconder, any comments? Uh, yes, I, I think I think they're good goals, and and uh, um, but uh, as long as you know, I was satisfied with the response from uh, from the deputy, and that uh, it, it's not set in stone that sh that should we need to take the money uh, and put it elsewhere, we have that option to do so. Thank you. Uh, comments from other council members, Councillor Budrick. Great idea on the uh, the tax stabilization and the utility stabilization. So, I mean, having the foresight to see that coming forward could uh, keep our constituents uh, uh, a little more at ease. So I like that idea. Very good. Thank you. Any other comments from seeing none? Back to the mover for final comment. Okay, thank you. Actually, before... I probably should have said this before I went back to the mover, but I'm just gonna make a quick comment. Just thank you to staff for um, all the work that's gone into this. Um, this is uh, a huge document, a lot of work, great presentation. I'm very glad to see us proceeding, proceeding down this path um, with, with working with uh, other levels of, of uh, government. It's always good to have very clear um, direction and transparency and uh, be able to uh, um, establish the funds so that it can benefit moving forward from here. So greatly appreciate it, thank you. So with that, I will call the question. All those in favor? And motion is passed, thank you. So moving to 4.5, operating surplus and deficit management policy and the presentation spoke to this as well. So it uh, this puts the dollars and cents, I guess, to the <laughs> previous motion. Um, any further comment from staff or rec recommendations or anything on this? Deputy Treasurer? Or? Uh, no, no further, further comments. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I open it up to council then. Uh, any comments or questions regarding this uh, report? It's seeing none, I will uh, ask what the pleasure of council is. There is a recommendation with four points. Um, what would council's wishes be? And Councillor Townsend. I move to receive the report and adopt recommendations one through four. So moved. Seconder, we have a second for that motion. Councillor Budrick, thank you. Uh, mover, Councillor Townsend, any comments? Seeing none. Councillor Budrick is seconder, seeing none. Any other comments from council? And seeing none, I will ask the question. All those in favor? Come, thank you. Motion is passed. So that brings us down to adjournment. And uh, again, I would just like to thank staff for all of the work that went into the, um, the, the presentations really sum it up, I find, too. So it, it's it's good for, we can all read the reports, but the I find the presentations sort of sometimes pull it together um, for me, which is really good. So 
I, I appreciate the work that went into these. So moving forward, um, there's no other um, items. I would take a motion for adjournment. Councillor Budrick and seconded by Councillor Parks. All those in favor? And motion is carried. Thank you. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.